Uh, if I have not met you yet, my name is Dan Ruda, and I'm continuing on, and we are together in the book of Acts through this series called Unleashed. And you may notice um, John Peacock and both Tommy Bowman, our leading executive pastors, they are out. Um, they are in what John would call the happiest place on earth, not Disneyland, uh, but it is actually Quetico. It's the Boundary Waters in Canada. And so they are very isolated right now, and they are camping and they are canoeing with some friends, and it's just a time they lead us so well and work so hard, it's a time for them to unplug and just kind of like get off the grid in God's creation and just be resting and refueling to come back and to continue to lead us through the summer and into the fall. So keep them in your prayers over this next week. Um, I already had a little conversation. There's a lot of bear up there. And so I was like, guys, just really be cautious of the bear. I was like, John, Tommy's built for speed. So like, he's got you. I just off the line, you're done. But you got those legs. And so just get low, dodge and weave. So I gave him a little coaching, but just pray that they stay safe. No bear attacks. We want them back here in one piece. Uh, so we are continuing on. And today we're going to be in Acts 4. And so far in the book of Acts, we have seen a church on the move fueled by the Spirit. A church on the move fueled by the Spirit. We've seen that the Spirit was poured out on men and women. That they took to the streets, they started speaking the name of Jesus. They were giving, and like there were no needs. They were gathering together in homes, they were taking communion together, they were unified in prayer. And thousands of people were being added to the church. It was like if you charted out the church, it'd be like up and to the right, this thing was just taken off. Uh, but today in Acts chapter 4, we're going to see it doesn't stay that way. And we got a long way to go yet in Acts. And so early on, we see in Acts chapter 4, this is really the first time that this movement reaches resistance. And so what do we do? Because mission, we've got a movement vision just like they did. Jesus gave this promise, you're going to be my witnesses. And we've got a vision to experience the movement of Jesus in the tent in our lifetime. And that's a vision for us individually and for us collectively. So what will we do and how will we act when this movement reaches resistance? When people that we love and want to help find and follow Christ turn their back not only on us but on the love of Jesus? How do we act when this movement is tempted to be contained? Because here's the thing, a church on the move, a church on the move that's making much of Jesus, that's being filled with his spirit two things will always happen. One, people will hear the good news of Jesus and receive him. It's always going to happen. And two, people will hear the good news of Jesus and resist him. And so how do we act when this happens? Today we're picking up in Acts chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 23 to 31. And just as a little like warning here, I'm going to read like four words and then stop us. So I know that may be frustrating, but we're going to have to get some of the backstory. So here we are, Acts 4, chapter 23. It says, on their release, Peter and John. All right, on their release. Let's just hit time out. Uh, where are they being released from? All right, so to get this story, we got we to backtrack a little bit. And it was about two weeks ago, I think, Tommy was up here and he was asking the question, does God still heal today? And he read this story of these two guys, Peter and John. And they were going to the temple to pray. It wasn't a new direction, something that they did in their normal everyday life, but it was a new intention. And so they were going to the temple to pray, and they see this lame beggar who's been there for like 40 years. And they see him differently. And they say, I don't have what you want, silver and gold, but I do have who you need. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And his legs become strong. And I can only imagine like he pops up and he's like, this is what it feels like to walk. Does a cartwheel. He's like, this is amazing. And he latches onto the arms of Peter and John. And he's like, I'm coming with you guys. Where are we going? And they walk in to the temple courts to pray. And it's there that there are hundreds and hundreds of people, unbelieving Jewish men who are in there. And they see this now healed, formerly lame beggar. And they're like, whoa, that guy? Time out. This is crazy. That guy's like he's up and walking. We all just walked past him. Now he's here, walking. And they ask a question that we've heard asked before. They go, somebody explain this to me. How did, how did this happen? 
And so Peter, he steps to the mic and he steps to the crowd and he gives his second sermon. It's the same one that I taught on last time I was up here. His sermon sounded like this. I can explain. This Jesus, whom you crucified, repent, receive. He's blessing people through us. Look, this guy's healed. And there, hundreds, more, more, repent, receive. And others step onto the scene and they try to shut it down. They resist it. It's the religious leaders, it's the teachers of the law. They go, "Uh uh-uh, not in here, no more. This is not happening. And they actually arrest Peter and John and they throw them in jail for the night. And if you can imagine this scene, we're watching. The healed guy's like, look what I can do. Like, I'm telling you, this is crazy. And Peter and John are getting arrested and they're like, repent and receive. And people are. This is crazy. And they're thrown in jail and they're put on trial the next day. It's like Zuckerberg in front of Congress. Did you see that? It's just like surrounded. There's Peter and John, healed guys there. Everybody who came forward, they're there because they want to see what this trial's all about. And the religious authority, the teachers of the law, they go, so what name and power did you do this? And healed guys like, still healed. And Peter, filled with courage and boldness, launches into his third sermon. What do you think it sounds like? This Jesus! It's the only one to salvation. That's it. And as he's talking to them, they resist. Mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. We're shutting this down. And so they huddle up and they go, okay, we have a problem. That guy's clearly still healed. I was kind of hoping that was going to go away over the night. But he's still healed. Can't argue with exhibit A. And Peter and John, they're not that good. They're just normal. Like they're not these like brilliant, like they're just normal, ordinary people. So something clearly is going on here. But we gotta stop this movement. We gotta shut it down. What do we do? And I can imagine the guy in the huddle, he's like, well, you asked him what the name and power was. They said Jesus. So I've got an idea. All right, break. Okay, Peter, John, no more Jesus. No more. You're not saying that name. Can't heal in that name. No more. And all of the power and authority, they go, you're done. This movement's over. And they go, I mean, if it comes between following who God is and who you guys are, we got to keep talking about what we're seeing. But so many people received Jesus that they were outnumbered, and so Peter and John left. They left. And they go back to their own people, Probably shaken up because this is still a very scary and real thing to be confronted like this. And so there they are in verse 23. So let's pick up. That's where they're being released from. On the release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And then they quote scripture back to God in their prayer. They quote Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So what do we do? How do we act when this movement reaches its resistance? We do what they did. There is one definitive answer. Prayer. Prayer. 
Now I have a hunch of what may have just happened and been felt in the room. Uh, For some, maybe you went, okay, come on. Oh, I know the power of prayer. And others, maybe we went, prayer? Really? Like, that's it. That's what's gonna, that's what's gonna move this thing forward. Pr- like prayer, like the thing I did when I was a kid? Like pr- I think maybe the last time I prayed was when that cop was behind me on the way in today. Like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> like pr- prayer, that's so passive. Come on, do something. Have a game plan. Two hits, me hitting you, you hitting the floor. Come on. Prayer, that's it. They knew, the church in Acts, they knew what has become true all throughout history, which is this. Movements of God are preceded and sustained by prayer to God. Movements of God, this one, you look at any movement throughout history, movements of God are preceded and sustained. They only last by prayer to God. We see this all throughout Acts. Acts 1, before the Spirit's poured out, they're together in unity, praying. Acts 2, they're gathering together in homes. They're given as nobody had any needs. They're praying together. Acts 3, Peter and John, normal day, we're going to pray. Acts 4, what do we do when there's a problem? We're getting together. We're praying. Prayer. Because movements of God are preceded and sustained by prayer to God. Wherever in the world there has been a movement of God spreading to the point of revival. It's an old word, but it's what we're praying for. A movement of Jesus in the 10 in our lifetime. Wherever that has spread to the point of revival, there have been men and women like them, together in unity, calling upon God in a place of humble dependency. Prayer. So I wanna be brief, but we're gonna move uh, and look at three observations about prayer for a movement-minded church. Three observations we see in this text about prayer. First, prayer. It's proactive to the mission. Prayer is proactive. See, oftentimes, and I've experienced this in my own life, it's like once I've exhausted options A through Z, it's like, guess we gotta pray now. (laughs) Prayer is proactive to the mission. You just saw a video on it. You heard Hannah talk about it. You heard Diana share her experience. Alpha. Many of you in this room, you've come up to me. We've been running Alpha for about a year now. And you're like, damn, what's the deal? I kind of want, like, want to be in it just to see. See what's under the hood. Like if people are up here talking about how they encountered Jesus through Alpha, they're getting baptized, their families are experiencing transformation. What's the secret sauce? Those of you who have been on the Alpha team, you know it. Prayer. It's prayer. It's prayer, proactive prayer. The team gets together and we pray for every guest who's gonna be coming in. We pray for the talks that they would land in people's hearts. We pray that the Holy Spirit would provide freedom. Proactive prayer, proactive prayer, proactive prayer. This is their plan A and I am just, I'm praying and asking that God would continue, he's doing it, but that he would continue to make this our plan A strategy. Because movements of God are preceded and sustained by prayer to God. Dick Eastman, in his book, The Hour That Changes the World, about prayer, says it this way. Where there is an absence of prayer, there will be an absence of power. Where there is frequency of prayer, there will be a continuing display of God's power. And we're seeing it. But prayer, it's proactive to the mission. So I want to ask you a question. And I want every single person to answer this for themselves. Prayer. (laughs) We're tracking. We're tracking. What in your life today needs the proactivity of prayer? What today in your life needs the proactivity of prayer? It can't wait anymore. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's spiritual breakthrough that you or somebody that you love isn't experiencing. What can't wait anymore? 
what needs to get brought up the rungs and prioritized, we're going to bring that to God in prayer. I want you to answer that because we're not just going to think about it, we're going to do something about it later. So the first observation, prayer is proactive to the mission. The second, the second, prayer is, we see it here, it's together in agreement. Prayer is together in agreement. I love what it says. Verse 23, Peter and John went back to their own people. Love that. Do you have your own people? Peter and John, they had theirs. Other followers of Jesus. They were proactive in prayer. They're like, I know who to go to. When stuff hits, I know, I know, I know my people. I know where I'm going to go. Diana, she's got hers. I love how she got, got like this big smile and started tearing up and she thought about the relationships that she met in Alpha and then went through and fostered in formation. I've got my people. It's my missional community. Seasons four, Roselle. They are proactive in prayer with me. They know what we're carrying. We know the weight and the needs of each other and we are interceding and praying for one another. The boiler room. Do you know your people? Here's the thing that I'm learning, and I, don't, I can't explain it all, but prayer together moves plans forward. There's this kind of unusual thing that we do in the church here in America that a lot of other churches around the world don't do. When it comes to our prayer life, when it comes to our faith in general, we just, we individualize everything. And me and my faith doesn't really overlap with you and yours all that much. But there's power when we pray in agreement together. It galvanizes and unifies the church and it moves the heart of God. Yes. There, there was an example, a story that came out uh, here. Happened uh, about a, a month ago. It was actually the last baptism Sunday. And I, I, you probably haven't heard this story, but if you were here during the 1045, you experienced this. So I want to kind of close the loop on what actually happened. A 1045 service. The story begins in the boiler room. You're like, what's the boiler room? The boiler room is this kind of music storage room down the hall. It's kind of dark and dungy, but it's lit up through the power of prayer every single Sunday morning. During both services, there are people together in there praying, proactively and praying, praying for you before you get here, praying over every minute of the service, every lyric being sung, every word being spoken. They're praying right now. And it was during the 1045, that often they're like, we'll just pray in general, and we'll ask God what he has for us. But something unique happened. Brad Bennett was in there, Kathy Rosalba was in there, Allison Fierce was in there, and they're praying. And it, it kind of took this turn. And Brad said, God, would you right now move somebody who's ready to go public with their faith who wasn't planning on it? We're asking proacti proactively, would you answer this prayer? Would you move somebody who's ready? They're just waiting. They weren't planning on it. And maybe it'll disrupt our plans. Maybe we'll have to scramble. We'll be fine with that. And Kathy's going, yeah. Yeah, and if there's a story of fear, if there's a story of fear, God, you're bigger than that. Would you remove that? And Allison, in agreement, says, God, would you do this? And as I'm asking them to tell me this story, they're saying, it doesn't always happen, but something happened where there was a unity and an agreement and a togetherness in prayer, and it was like we were participating with God in his activity. Split screen during the 1045. Jordy Rose is here. She's sitting there. Hi, Jordy. She's like, it's it. This is it. This is my time. I wasn't planning on it. Didn't see it coming. But I'm ready. And I'm going right now because he's calling me and I'm not waiting. And when it comes to the little disrupting of plans, her husband Jack was our bass player in the band that day. And he's like, I'm out. Puts the bass down. <laughs> I'm getting in the holy hot tub. Dustin's up there, service directing. He's like, oh, headset off, runs down here, picks up the base. We have no idea. But Kathy's here standing in the corner watching and reporting back to the boiler room. God's answering our prayer right now. Like right now. Eyes as big as saucers. I remember talking to me afterwards about it. And they're saying, we're not going to remember that day because it, it grew our faith, it unified us, and we participated in what God is doing. Prayer together in agreement. It moves the plans forward and it moves the heart of God. And I, I, before this like becomes overly simplified, like this isn't a formula. I have prayed in agreement with others about things and not seen that outcome. 
So I can't explain it all. I can't explain why God acts in certain ways at certain times. That's a perspective he holds. But what I am learning is this. I think God wants to grow us up. He wants to grow me up. I'll go first. I think there's so much we are going to experience together in unity in prayer when we depend on him to experience the movement of Jesus in the tent in our lifetime. And I want all of us to have those experiences where it's like God is answering and responding real time. And you may hear that story and go, that's a, that's a very neat story. But that could just very well maybe a coincidence. And it does sound like one. But here's what I believe. I believe in Matthew 18, 20, which says this. Where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And Jesus right now is in the boiler room through his spirit with them, and he was with them in this moment in agreement. He's going, I I hear you. Work with me. So where do I land with this? When I can't figure out exactly how God chooses to respond, here's where I am. William Temple has said it this way. When I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. I'm good with that. Good with that for now. Something supernatural happens when we agree together in prayer. It looks like unity. It feels like love. It moves the heart of God and it grows our faith and it matures us. Prayer. It's together in agreement. Third observation. Prayer. It's reliant on God. It's reliant on God himself. This is big. Because prayer is not just a means to get something from God, but rather to be with him. It's to be reminded of who he is and who we are. I love what uh, Max Licato says on this prayer being reliant on God. I love this quote. The power of prayer is in the one who hears it not the one who says it. And I know, I want to read that again because I know some of you, we've talked about this and there's a hesitancy to pray. The power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not in the one who says it. I've felt this in my own life and and I've had this conversation with some of you where you're like, I want to pray, I want to grow at prayer, I want to pray with others, but I know how it's going to (laughs) sound. And if I can't sound like I'm like a professional prayer, which I don't even know what that is or who that is, but if I can't do it like that, then I'll just like wait. I understand that and I've shared that experience with you. But I also want to say, that's like saying, if I cannot cook like a three-star Michelin chef, I'm not going to (laughs) eat. Like prayer is nourishment for our souls. We come starving at times. Power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not in the one who says it. So how does, this, how does this whole thing work out? Reliant on God. What does that mean? Does that just mean like I sit back, let go, let God? Does that just mean like he knows he'll, he'll do it? They're very purposeful with how they pray when they come together in agreement. Here's what they do. They don't discredit or minimize the very real threat. Right? There's stuff that's weighing heavy on us. And what's not helpful are when people are like, brush it off, be stronger. And even at times, although it's true, God's got this. Okay? But look at what they do. They take the very real weight of that threat, and they don't discredit it. But what they do is they position it against the weight of God's glory. And when they do that, immediately God begins to work on their hearts. They bring this very real threat and they go, Sovereign Lord, you're you're all powerful. This is not outside of you. You're not surprised by this. You didn't just 
wake up when we came to you. You see us. You're creator. You're the one who made and sustains everything. The very breath I have right now is because you're granting it. You see this. And they let the weight of that real situation and the weight of God's glory go to work on it. They take the very thing that's going to threaten to defeat them and they bring it to an undefeated God. And they go, this is your battle. And in it, they begin to receive what they need, which is himself. It says, as they finished praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They asked for this boldness in declaring to him who he is. They didn't ask for an exit strategy. They didn't say, can you change up the game plan? They said, give us boldness to continue doing the thing that you've called us to, to be your witnesses. We need you to achieve what you've called us to. And they receive what they most need and what you and I most need when we pray. Himself, his very presence, his spirit. For them, prayer was a means to be with God himself, not just receive his stuff. There's one note that kind of stood out to me around this whole shaken thing. I was sitting at Starbucks trying to work on this about what we're going to talk about, and I was like, that's interesting. Like the, the house that they were in, was, the place they were in was shaken, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They get boldness. I was like, what would it be like to be in there? Like us right now, this whole place just starts like shaking. Okay. <clears throat> but I was sitting there with my Starbucks drink, and I was like, shaken. I was like, being shaken means something stronger than you is acting upon you. Like, I thought I'd, I'd be terrified. But I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm seeing this. Like, they're being made bold in the shaking because they realize they aren't the ends of themselves. There is an unshakable God who has an unshakable spirit who wants to fill them to do the things that he's called them to do. And they are made bold. Not bulldozers. Boldness is confidence and humility. Boldness comes in the having been shaken. See, every single one of these people who is made bold and they go on proclaiming the name of Jesus, they would still say this is true of them. Psalm 40, verse 2. They would still say, he lifted me out of the slimy pit out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand. Boldness does not come from self-confidence. Boldness comes from having been shaken. And so if you're waiting for self-confidence, you and I, myself included, we're not going to find it. But boldness comes from going to God in prayer and telling him who he is and asking to be filled with his spirit so that we can continue the good things that he's called us to. And they're made bold. It doesn't come from self-confidence. It comes from having been shaken, being with God. So three observations that we see. Prayer, it's proactive to the movement. It's together in agreement. And it's reliant on God. And so I was thinking about how to end today. And I felt like really unsettled. I was like, I just feel really weird about talking about and reading about prayer, knowing all the things that are in this room. And so I was like, we're just going to create some space for prayer. And if you just came out with a cold sweat, like, don't, don't, don't freak out. I, it, it, won't be, it won't be that weird, all right? I'll give you some handles for how we're going to do this. So here's how you can engage. We're going to take five minutes. And here are three ways you can engage in prayer over these next five minutes. The band's going to come up here. They're going to be coming out right now. They're going to be playing some music and filling the room, so it's okay. You can pray on your own. That's all right. You could pray on your own. If you're brand new to this, I would invite you to just pray this simple prayer. God, I'm open. Behind me on the screen, there's going to be some truths about who God is. And like them, we can bring truth of who God is to him in our prayer. 
It's one thing to bring our circumstances to God. It's another thing to speak God into our circumstances. And so you can pray calling back who God is. So you can pray on your own. You can pray with others. Maybe you're surrounded by family. Maybe you're surrounded by friends. Maybe it's just people you know and you don't really mind. I would encourage you, get up, move. Get in the aisle, huddle up, pray with others. We need this as a church to hear the prayers and the voices of each other relying upon God himself. Pray with others. Third, you can receive prayer from others. There are people in the back ready to pray for you. Moving now. The most proactive thing you can do is move your legs, stand up, and be prayed for. So whether you pray on your own, whether you pray with others, whether you receive prayer from others, we're going to take five minutes. And we're going to carry what we have. We're going to ask God to shake us and make us bold. So I'm going to open us, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you guys to mill about and move. The band's going to play some music, and then I'm going to close us. Let me open, let's pray. Sovereign Lord, Creator, God, you, you've made everything. You sustain it by your very power. You know every single person here by name. You know their desires. You know their worries. You know their anxious thoughts. You see it all. And through your son, Jesus, you proved you love us. You love them. God, right now, in the things of this world that maybe have shaken us. Anxiety has taken over. Fear has crept in. There's a weight, maybe just a general numbness. God, we bring that to you, and would the weight of your glory go to work? Shake us today. Have us bump up into the power that you have as we come to you in prayer right now.